Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this tech second regional dialogue on innovative financial mechanisms to promote equity and sustainability in agriculture. Today, we will be focusing on the Asia and Asia Pacific region. My name is Josefina, and I'm here representing the Secretariat of the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification. And today's dialogue forms part of a series of regional dialogues across the globe that tries to understand how to incentivize farmers to protect and restore nature. This dialogue today is being co-organized by the commission, by COSAI, with the support of the uh, IUCN regional office in Asia and the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Studies and Research in Agriculture, CIARCA. So let's begin with this dialogue and let me welcome Dr. Dindo Kampilan. He's the regional director for IUCN Asia to set the stage. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dindo. Thanks, Josefina. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. We're gathering today fresh from the COPs in Glasgow and Kunming. We heard lots of great ideas shared in arresting the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Interestingly, a common theme for the SCOPs is financing, sustainable, equitable, and accessible financing. But the issue of financing is not new. In the agricultural sector, mobilizing finance has been a perennial call towards more sustainable and equitable pathways to agricultural development. But decades later, what has been the progress made and what could still be done? What analytical models, investment tools, enabling instruments have been developed with potential for scaling. So today we'll learn about the global state of knowledge and practice, thanks to COSAI for sharing the study led by the SDG Center for Latin America and the Caribbean. We're also gonna hear not just about agricultural finance per se, but how we could reimagine, revisit, and improvise financial innovations in paying for nature and society. IUCN is very proud to be associated with COSAI through our being represented in the commission. This dialogue also builds in part on a similar forum uh, with COSAI organized in the IUC and World Conservation Congress held in Marseille just two months ago. Back here in Asia, there is no shortage of ideas and experiences in the area of development finance, including emerging models from various institutional stakeholders. This allow us for intra and inter-regional comparisons while also closely examining what innovations are worth learning and sharing. Given the pace of progress in innovating towards sustainable and equitable finance, it's essential to reflect what remains as the key obstacles and challenges. We expect this dialogue not only to gain knowledge, but build bridges of collaboration long after this event concludes today. What partnership platforms need to be developed and strengthen for translating ideas into policies and actions for us to make informed decisions and in sporting field implementation. We congratulate Shirka, our co-organizer, for its month-long celebration of its 50th anniversary. That's over half a century of being a regional center of excellence in sustainable agriculture in the Southeast Asia region. Meanwhile, here at ICN, we've just launched a new global center for investment and finance. And we are, keen to, we are keen to hear today about take home messages by the launching of our key initiatives in this part of the world. We've also launched a new sub program initiative in agriculture to further nurture the common ground between nature and agriculture. So while we at IUCN, we take pride in being the world's largest, oldest, and most diverse environmental organization, we fully realize much more needs to be done in achieving our vision of conserving and valuing nature for a just world. Many of the participants today are interested in finance that directly supports agricultural practice. For IUCN, a particular angle of interest to us is financing the underlying and overarching ecosystems that support agriculture and land uses for what we call the three Ps, for the planet, prosperity, and people. What sustainable and innovative financing could be harnessed from nature-based solutions, NBS, of resilient agricultural landscapes, to a green list of protective and conserved areas, both terrestrial and marine. 
Financing is a critical ingredient in getting us closer to the achievement of IUCN's vision. And mobilizing finance in government, multilateral agencies, private sector, and other institutions will remain a primary challenge for us all. So we're really looking forward to both the presentation of evidence from the study, the perspectives from our panelists today, and of course, the discussions for the rest of the session. Again, welcome to this dialogue. Good day, everyone. Over to you, Josefina. Thank you very much, Dindo, for those words and for setting the stage for this dialogue. Uh, and as you have acknowledged, we have COSAI, the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification, is formed by 21 commissioners from all over the Global South. And one of our commissioners is a Deputy Director General for IUCN, Miguel Aguilar, who we are very grateful to put us in touch with the regional offices as well for supporting us in this dialogue. We have already hosted one of the regional dialogues for Latin America, Today is Asia, and in the coming months, we will also be hosting a couple of dialogues for Africa. So stay in tune with POSAI and the future events that we will be having. Now, we turn to the presentation of, of one of the pieces of evidence that COSAI is uncovering to better understand what needs to change in order to support farmers in a more sustainable and equitable way. Uh, joining us from Colombia, who pre-recorded this, uh, this presentation special for this session, unfortunately couldn't join us today because of uh, time, difference, time differences, but we have Dr. Jimena Rueda, she's one of our main commissioners, the lead investigator, and she's also chairing the working group focusing on environmental aspects of sustainable agriculture intensification. And she will present to you evidence from a study produced by uh, the SDG Center for Latin America and the Caribbean for COSAI. So let's hear what Jimena had to say um, about the main findings of this global review on how financial incentives have been used in agriculture and the major gaps and the needs for future innovation. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for, for listening to my presentation. What I will be talking today about is the lessons that we have derived from existing economic instruments, um, basically instruments that have been applied to conservation, to biodiversity conservation and carbon sequestration. And what, we're, what we would like to do is to try to move forward on how those instruments can be improved to incentivize farmers to conserve and restore nature in ways that are equitable. We have done this work with the support of COSAI, the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Intensification, and the COTS, which, which is the Center for the Sustainable Development Goals for Latin America. Um, and this is the work in collaboration with Lina Moros and Josefina Achaval Torre, Dairon Monroy, Manuela Quijano, and Sergio Puerto. Uh, these are preliminary results, but we're really uh, happy to be able to share them with you. We are really talking about these type of instruments that are right in the middle, um, that somehow combine um, incentives and motivations for farmers to change their behavior, and that are, for the most part, based on the market. They, there is a, a payment or a, a buyer and a seller involved in these in these instruments, and they have been around for about twenty years. They're quite novel, and we would like to see what has been the evidence on whether they work or not, and how can they be applied to agriculture. Okay, so let's start with the, with the instruments. I'm gonna go one by one to show you what the literature is, is telling us on whether they work or not. What have we found? Uh, we've, we have results on, in Costa Rica and Mexico mainly, where forest cover has really increased. It has lowered deforestation rates, but it has had limited uh, impacts on income. So quite effective in terms of conservation, not so much in terms of um, equity and distribution of, of the results. Um, and has been applied in agriculture, mainly in Nicaragua for degraded lands, so not only for tropical system conservation, tropical uh, forest conservation. And it also has been applied in civil pastoral systems, introducing trees into uh, extensive cattle ranching as a way of enhancing um, that production system. So there has been some applications in agriculture. Uh, the challenges, as I was mentioning earlier, is the trade-offs between equity and scale. That means that um, even though they're quite effective in terms of, of reaching uh, um, a high number of hectares and providing really lower deforestation rates, they tend to be concentrated in the larger farmers who can provide those services um, at the cost of leaving behind the smallholders. So where we see opportunities for innovation 
uh, on the one hand, there is the possibility of really expanding them to agricultural systems and not only forests, and also expand them to other, um, other ecosystems, as I was mentioning before, um, savannas and other type of ecosystems can also be, if, if they provide important uh, system, um, ecological services such as biodiversity, conservation, or carbon sequestration, as in the case of peatlands, they can be also um, increased or enhanced and, and reach out, reach by these, these systems, these, these type of, of mechanisms. Uh, we, can, we also see an opportunity in changing from in individual payments to collective payments in order to produce a more equitable distribution of, of the benefits and that the payments can be also differentiated according to area or lost income because one hectare of land for a smallholder uh, has a very high opportunity cost compared to a large owner, the same hectare. And quite right now in the market, they're being paid at the same rate. All so right. we, then we explore RED, RED Plus, which is this mechanism introduced by the United Nations to provide incentives to developing countries. Uh, so they undertake um, emission reduction activities linked to deforestation. So it's to avoid deforestation and to um, reduce the, the potential emission of uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, we have found that um, they have in interesting results in, term of, in terms of increased forest cover, uh, but they also reduce the access that communities have to other forest products. So once they have been established as conservation areas and people receive resources to, to be able to maintain that conservation area, access to non-timber forests, to um, game and other types of benefits that people derive from those forests is limited, and that has impact on food security and, of course, on, on equity and, and distribution of, of wealth. Um, it can be included, uh, the applications in agriculture show us that farmers have been included only for monitoring activities, and we do think that there is, there is room for doing more than just uh, having farmers like being the stewards of this forest and monitor that nobody enters, that there, there could be a more active involvement of farmers in, in Red Plus. The challenges, um, well, the lack of inclusion of other land uses and strategies to improve livelihoods, like how can we, if this access has been limited, how can they supplement their livelihood strategies with other activities or actually be more flexible and allow some land uses to occur? Um, that's, um, like the, that's how we see it, with, uh, we, we can overcome that limitation. And the opportunities for innovation in terms of red plus are uh, on the one hand to allow, allow low intensity agriculture within the forest. We know that there is traditional farming practices, practices that um, you know, have been around for more than 2000 years that are very low, very low in intensity and uh, actually help maintain um, some equilibrium between forest conservation and people's livelihoods. Uh, also to increase the tolerance for small per perturbations in the ecosystems. We know that these uh, forests have no, are not pristine forests. They have been inhabited for thousands of years and these perturbations are part of the system. They have in a way co-evolved as, as we have seen in many of the Amazonian uh, ecosystems. There are species that have been, that wouldn't be there if, if it wasn't for human intervention that uh, has cultivated that. Um, over the years and and um, this symbiotic relationship between the forest and the people has to be recognized and maintained. Um, so then we go into voluntary sustainability standards. These are what we probably know better, which are certifications, sort of deforestation agreements, codes of conduct, mainly produced by or designed by NGOs and applied to actors in the value chain. So what have we found? In terms of results, um, they're quite mixed. It depends on the product. So for certifications, for instance, in coffee, we have studied coffee in India and the Americas in Uganda, and we've seen the, the papers show high compliance. Farmers really comply with the requirements of the certification, and they produce additionality, which means they not only preserve what is there, but they actually go beyond and introduce uh, good practices such as shading coffee or um, more... Um, the uh, introduction of trees around the farm and so forth that enhance the biodiversity of the of their plots, but we see very little impact on livelihoods, and this is mainly because the price premium that are sometimes offered uh, linked to these um, activities uh, are quite counter cyclical. So, if the, if the international price of coffee is high, 
the price premium is really low. In the, if the international price is low, the pri price premium compensates. So it has an impact in terms of um, reducing the volatility of the, um, of the uh, prices, but not really on income. So income is more stable, but not higher due to, this, um, to the, the introduction of this certification. In terms of the moratoria, we have the soy and the cattle moratoria in Brazil, which are, have been the most um, successful ones, especially the soy moratoria, quite successful in terms of compliance, a little bit of additionality, meaning a little bit of extra forest conservation, um, and very interesting in terms of income. And cattle has been more difficult because cattle moves, so it's harder to trace back to pastures or, or places where the cattle was raised and whether it had been deforested or not. Um, so, so the compliance is quite mixed, very, very hard to do, uh, to prove additionality because of the traceability. Um, what, what applications do we see for, for agriculture? So mainly agroforestry in this um, commodity chains that can introduce trees among the crop, uh, such as coffee and cacao, um, but also bans on deforestation, such as the, the moratorium. So where do we see opportunities for innovation? First of all, to work at a more jurisdictional approach. So not only go farm by farm, choosing and picking those that have the best opportunities, but actually working with a full landscape or a full watershed. So everybody in that region can actually uh, improve their practices. Uh, because when we talk about um, ecosystem services and uh, landscape level solutions, if only some of the farmers adopt and the others don't, then all the effort is in a way lost because um, pollution continues, deforestation continues, even, even though some farmers are adopting better practices. So if we have this, if we promote more landscape level approaches, uh, we think that um, these instruments can be more effective. And the other one is how to reduce the, the cost for smallholders, <laughs> sorry, um, to, to make them, um, to, make the, to make it easier for them to, to do the transition towards uh, these uh, sustainability standards and how to introduce the standards for um, crops that are not traded in the international market. Okay, the fourth one is bio offsets, which is a mechanism that has been used mainly in the global north to um, help companies or allow companies to compensate biodiversity losses of one infra large infrastructure, infrastructure projects or large um, land use change that happens in one side so they can compensate by um, setting aside biodiversity harbor somewhere else. Um, we have seen applications in agriculture. It could be applied for re regeneration of degraded lands, um, but the, the challenges are very large. First of all, is really, there is an opportunity to improve these bio offsets. There is money being spent there, um, and and we think that if it, if it was if it was to target degraded lands, it could provide a better result. Also, um, there is there are some experiences trying to um, protect agrobiodiversity, the biodiversity that is inside agricultural crops, and and biodiversity that also relates to the land races and to the varieties that are being lost in terms of the crops we use. So, so we think that there could be a focus on these um, biodiversity offsets to be moved towards this, um, the, the preservation of agrobiodiversity, not only biodiversity uh, in its, as a whole or in itself. And the last one, and I'm, I'm almost done with my presentation and thank you so much for listening, is impact investment. Impact investment are those, um, funds that the private sector and the public sector have set aside in order to um, mobilize resources, but that are in a way more patient than traditional investment that are willing to wait to see the results, not only the financial results of their investments, but also that those investments have uh, social and environmental results. Um, the challenges we see there is that there are many projects but there are great distance between the farmers and the actual uh, funder. You know, it goes through lots of intermediaries and, and it's not always easy to figure out um, whether it's producing any changes. And there are no rigorous impact evaluation. They're all, all, always done by the companies, the financial companies themselves. So it's, it's hard to figure out whether there is an impact there. Um, we see um, opportunities for innovation. There are new emerging financial instruments that can be applied to agricultural intensification in sustainable ways, such as blended finance, which is bringing private and public 
funding blockchain that um, can introduce transparency in value chains, the tokenization of nature, which is this idea that people can actually invest directly in protecting specific ecosystems and specific trees and, and places around the world. So, so that this investment is not directed by large banks, but actually by citizens and what has been called a citizen crowdfunding and that be really decentralized financing. And we think there is an opportunity there, uh, but also it needs more impact assessment and monitoring to make sure that they, they do work for, for the rural poor. So where do we see in general room for improvement? These are just my, my last comments. Um, for agro, agro biodiversity and degraded lands, that's an opportunity for investors that hasn't been uh, tackled yet. These jurisdictional approaches that can overcome the limitations on, of voluntary mechanisms by making them more landscape-wide activities uh, where communities can play a more definitive role, not only in monitoring, but also in the design of the mechanism. Um, strong government policies are required to complement private instruments um thanks so thank you very much for that presentation uh that was very insightful uh, evidence that Casa is uncovering and that Jimena presented uh, and, and for us. Uh, we have two, we see two key messages that are coming out of this presentation and of this evidence. First of all, is that instruments that are developed for conservation offer, um, offer great opportunities for expansion into the agricultural landscapes where the rural poor live. And also that to be more effective, this type of instruments or, or mechanisms need innovations that are that can be political, technological, and institutional, but within the reach of, of the current actors. So we have brought together a very interesting panel to hear the different perspectives of these actors and to uh, hear about their experiences with design or with implementation of these innovative financial incentives that can be applied to agriculture and have been applied to agriculture as well. So we will have, uh, we have a quite, quite a diverse panel joining us today. First of all, we will have Dr. Gamini Samara Singh. He's the additional secretary of agricultural technology for the Ministry of Agriculture in Sri Lanka. Dr. Samara Singh will bring the perspective of the government to this dialogue. We also have Dr. Prasun Kumar Das, secretary general of the Asia Pacific Rural and Agricultural Credit Association, APRATA. And uh, Dr. Das will share innovative financial instruments from the experience of APRATA as an apex organization of agricultural development banks in Asia. We also have joining us today, Ms. Irish Bagilat. She's the coordinator for the UN Decade of Family Farming and the Women Fam Women's Farmers Agenda uh, for the Asian Farmers Association. And Irish will talk from a farmer's perspective about the need uh, for some positive incentives as some of the issues that can arise in practice. We will have also in the panel Ms. Erin Sweeney. She's the lead for sustainable investment and inclusion for Grow Asia. And she will be drawing on the experiences as one of the lead implementers of the Asian guidelines um, for promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry. And last but not least, uh, in the panel, we have Mr. Ilko Bronkhorst. He's the managing director for, for financial access, and he will be sharing his perspective from the private sector. So welcome to all of our panelists, and thank you very much for joining us today. We will begin with one of you asking some questions uh, to each of you, and then we will move on to, to a more free interaction. So why don't we begin with uh, Dr. Samara Singh from your experience in Sri Lanka. We would love to hear a bit more, because we have discussed previously uh, about uh, implementation of subsidy schemes or other incentives that are sometimes uh, tied to uh, certain conditionalities or tied to best agricultural practices. And the introduction of these best practices sometimes is costly and requires investment also in rural extension and other mechanisms for the practices to, to spread. So could you share from your experience uh, in the Sri Lankan government and with the Ministry of Agriculture, how the state participate in, in this type of initiatives and in, innovative, in, in innovating in, in financial incentives? Over to you, uh, Dr. Samara Singh. Thank you, Jasmina, and uh, for the opportunity to, to share the Sri Lankan experience. And good morning and good afternoon to all. Now, in, as you, uh, you may aware, Sri Lanka is a very, uh, has a very uh, good diversity of crops. So uh, with the COVID situation, the government policy uh, uh, to produce uh, whatever we can produce, like major crops, rice maize, chili, cowpea, green gram, black gram, big onion as well. And uh, Sri Lanka is mostly the 
small holder uh, the land allotments uh, 80 percent of the uh, lands are less than uh, two hectares therefore the government decided to support with the subsidies grants loan plus uh, uh, loan plus grants to uh, have this production uh, in a very effective way so if i take the example now subsidy actually government initially uh, thought of uh, giving the subsidy for seed subsidy that is uh, 100% uh, to 50% of the cost uh, is covered by the seed subsidy and also recently government uh, now with the new uh, policy decision to go for uh, green agriculture for the compost production also 12500 hectares uh, 12500 rupees per hectare was given so and uh, government realizes this uh, subsidies uh, uh, is giving uh, not uh, only subsidies but also grants and loans for example now we have this world bank project uh, called agriculture sector modernization project they are they try to produce entrepreneurs like if you take for example crop like chili uh, they have given grants for uh, producing multi materials because this is modernization of agriculture and then the irrigation systems and also uh, protected nets as well. Uh, and the uh, loan plus grants, if I talk about this, uh, that is IFAD funded projects, smallholder agribusiness partnership project that provides uh, loan plus grants. Now uh, it has this 4P four uh, four mechanism that's called, uh, it's a combination of public promoter production and partners. So public is actually mainly uh, involved with the project and the promote is a company and the production is the farmers and also partners are uh, it work together. So I, let me give an example now, vegetable cluster of 400 farms, right, has been produced. So they have been uh, given the, provided the grants of 60% grant and 40% loans. So in that case, uh, the system works like uh, value chains and all. Uh, so that is a, a successful project uh, going in Sri Lanka. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the, we realize especially the giving subsidy only is a uh, issue because uh, it's very difficult to estimate the, uh, the uh, get the real benefit beneficiaries of this uh, subsidy is very difficult uh, for the field workers right so we are in future we are looking for uh, output subsidies rather than seed subsidies over to you Josephine. thank you very much uh dr samara singh for for those examples and for sharing the experiences of sri lanka i think it's very interesting what you mentioned about this the the project that is trying to uh, do public promoters production and partners and bring them together and uh and of course the, the benefits directly to to the small holders i think it's very interesting also to highlight that in a country like sri lanka you mentioned 80 percent of the land uh of, of the farmers uh are have less than two hectares right so i think uh this is very important so when we're trying to focus on the on the farm level and on the smallholders being the, the beneficiaries of this type of incentives. So um, let me ask you just a, a quick follow-up question uh, because you mentioned uh, that sometimes these projects are funded by international organizations or in this case, you mentioned a project funded by the World Bank. So how do you see the role of the government in, in supporting this project? And one, once the funding from the, the international funding is gone, what can you do to complement this and to still help the farmers and not just uh, remain as a pilot project? Could you tell us a bit more about that and the role yeah. of, of the uh, government? Uh, so thank you for the question. It's a good question. Actually, these all projects are operated through the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, the agriculture projects. So uh, we do a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the we are uh, monitoring and evaluation is done by the Ministry of Agriculture. So uh, we, are, we make sure that uh, funds are utilized uh, in a proper way that uh, getting the benefit of the farmers and uh, finally uh, to the country as well, right? Mm -hmm. so, and uh, uh, yeah. Do you feel from, from your experience with this project, does it require 
uh, a lot of uh, a lot of extra support. I mean, how how important? How do you bring the partners together? For example, in this that you're talking about public promoters, production, and partners. Do you think yes. this is an essential part of the of the process? And if you can uh, maybe elaborate a bit more about this. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, uh, if you take this uh, four B project, the public uh, is the uh, the public section is by the government and the uh, project is. Uh, doing this uh, administrative thing and the company is a well, mm -hmm. well popular company which produces uh, which uh, sells the vegetables right is it gets so they have to find the uh, uh, farmers right mm -hmm. for example now vegetable cluster they have 400 farmers right then the farmers produce and they may make sure that they are purchasing the products of the farmers right mm -hmm. and then uh, they work together and we make the whole value chain uh, intact and uh, have a very good uh, system, uh, sustainable system, right? Thank you. Thank you for that answer, uh, Dr. Samara Singh. And I think this is a great uh, nexus to our next panelist. Our next panelist is representing the farmers. We have uh, Irish Vagila joining us uh, from the Philippines, and she's part of the Asian Farmers Association. So uh, we will get back to you, Dr. Samara Singh, after, uh, in, in just a couple of minutes. But thank you for, for your answers to this question. Welcome, Irish, to the panel. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, what I would like to ask you is, is that a lot of this um, financial instruments being portrayed as, as new and innovative sometimes defer, uh, um, I mean, sometimes it seems like um, there's no real innovation or there's a bit of repackaging of, of instruments that had existed before. So how do you think uh, these instruments are, are beneficial in like from the farmer's perspective? And do you think that farmers organizations like yours could take on the job of innovating as well new green financial instruments with their members that can benefit environment and people? Over to you, Irish, and welcome. Yes, uh, thank you, Josefina, for uh, that. And thank you to COSAI and the other organizers for inviting the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, or AFA. And uh, before I start, I just want to say that um, AFA has 20 uh, member organizations in 16 countries with around uh, 13 million small-scale women. Men producers engage in crops, livestock, uh, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. And further, we are uh, implementing an Asia Pacific um, a program uh, reaching to 12 more uh, countries. So, yeah, uh, responding to your um, question, Josefina, first of all, um, uh, I want to underscore the fact that innovation can happen at different uh, levels. Uh, it can be, you know, it can be an existing uh, model. It can be an existing framework if implemented in a different context. I think, uh, I hope we all agree that um, somehow it can be uh, innovative. Um, it can be innovation can be done um, at the design uh, in in the house. How 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 they are implemented or um, the assumptions that are made or the target outcomes uh, of these uh, instruments or projects or the relationships or, or the narratives. So going back to the instruments that were uh, presented in, in the study, I would say that there are um, similarities with existing uh, financing uh, instrument or uh, you, you, you specified uh, microfinance models. Uh, there are similarities and yes, they intersect uh, at some point when we talk about the SDGs or when we talk about uh, other uh, global, uh, global um, development um, outcomes. And maybe these uh, financial instruments um, are similar in how they are delivered. But obviously uh, the ones um, that were uh, presented are much more different from uh, the, the, uh, the existing uh, microfinance um, in, in many aspects, uh, in particular their target outcomes and on the effect and the time frame of how the effect or the benefits are felt by farmers or communities. So um, in, you know, in, in our discussion, I wanted to contribute uh, some, some uh, two points based on, on our experience as an organization when it comes to uh, financing or um, implementing financial instruments. So 
Recently, Alpha has implemented uh, an Arise, uh, the Arise project uh, with IFAD. So it's assuring resiliency of family farmers amidst COVID-19. So this project is around providing revolving funds to our uh, national uh, members and also uh, eventually to other uh, farmers organization which are not necessarily members of AFA, uh, not just organizations, but national cooperatives. And even to local farmers organizations and uh, cooperatives. So with this project, um, the revolving fund, uh, not only that, it provides capital to the farmers organization or to the farmers to protect their livelihood or enterprises. It also strengthens their capacity as an organization. And that's what I wanted to highlight in this debate or discussion about adapting this financial instrument to the context of agri-development or, uh, or uh, agroecological transition or food systems uh, transition. So what, what I see, um, given uh, some of the findings, if these instruments, um, large scale, uh, implemented on, on a large scale, if it's implemented along with farmers organization, national farmers organizations or cooperatives, I think uh, the economic impact would be much more, um, or it will be felt more by the farmers as compared when it is done in an uh, you know, individual uh, manner. Why do I say this? Because uh, we have seen that uh, our members, uh, the cooperative members, if they are professionally managed with dedicated leadership, if they are strong, they are able to generate profit and share profits to their members through dividends. dividends and they are able to service their members according to their needs and also other uh, services such as education, providential loans, housing loans. And we have a lot of, of, of these. So in AFA, uh, we have um, a member in, uh, in Mongolia, uh, NAMAC. They have, uh, it's a national um, cooperative um, and they have around 500 cooperative members and they are managing uh, their own financial institution. And same in India with uh, SEWA, our member, uh, they are strong organization. Uh, they have millions of members and they, they, they are able to um, implement large scale uh, programs. So this is what I wanted to bring in the discussion. I think uh, the, the working with organized group with farmers organization, uh, maybe uh, the economic impact, um, which is of course um, aligned with the sustainability of uh, the intervention um, might be more um, uh, felt by the farmers. So um, yeah. Thank you very much, Iris, for, for that intervention. And I think there's you, you made some very, very good key points that I, that I just would like to highlight. So first of all, you mentioned that innovation can happen at all levels. And this is something that, that from the commission, this is something that we are also, it's the same concept of innovation that we have. You know, it can happen at all levels and it can happen in different spheres as well, not only technological, but political, we can have social innovation. So I thought that was very, very important that you mentioned. Also that you highlighted the, the outcomes, the, what, what matters is the outcomes of what happens after those incentives, right? So we want to help the farmers to have steady livelihoods. We want to help, we want to help them protect and restore nature. So what can we do to make sure that the funds that are going into agriculture and into agricultural finance actually reach the farmers and benefit them on the ground? Uh, also, you mentioned context matters, and, and this is something very important as well, because, for example, in the case of, of smallholders, it's not the same uh, definition of a smallholder in one country than in the other one. Sometimes a smallholder is referred to as someone with less than two hectares. Sometimes in a different context, it would be 200 hectares, and the land uh, tenure and the ownership of, of the land as well uh, changes a lot. And then uh, lastly, that you mentioned the importance of the leadership of, of cooperatives. And I think this is also, also really important. And the fact that, yes, the farmer uh, organizations and the cooperatives are the ones that should be and can be, can be and should be at the center of all of this, these incentives in terms of design to be able to consider, uh, to consider this, um, uh, the, the outcomes, but in terms of implementation uh, as well. So, so thank you, Irish. And I will get back to you with a bit of a follow-up uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to, before we move on to the next question and the next panelist, I just want to keep encouraging uh, the attendees that I see you already using the chat, just keep using the chat, sharing uh, experiences that you think may be relevant to this topic, but also asking questions 
directly to one of the panelists or to anyone that we will try to pick up by the, uh, after the initial set of, of questions. So I'm going to turn now to Dr. Prasun Kumar Das. He's based out of Bangkok and he's here representing APRAKA. Uh, so welcome uh, Prasun and thank you very much uh, for joining us in this dialogue. It's a pleasure to have you here. Prasun, uh, you mentioned that APRAKA is working with, uh, with the FAO on a project on small scale fisheries that has been implemented in the Philippines and Thailand to establish a credit and insurance program and supporting uh, the fishers through new mechanisms that are uh, based on uh, existing collateral based financing. So maybe you can tell us a bit more about how these uh, initiatives and these innovative mechanisms were designed and how were the partners encouraged to participate? Let's start there. So Sabrina, for this opportunity to, uh, to provide some of our perspective from uh, the uh, basically what I will talk about the banker's perspective. You know, uh, other financial institutions across this region, we are working in 24 countries with uh, 88 uh, strong members uh, along with the central banks. So, so, so what, when I will be talking, I will be talking about the banker's perspective. But before that, I'd like to tell you that we, we uh, when, uh, uh, when we will be speaking on this, we will be talking about some of the uh, surveys we made, which is a ba uh, you know, baseline survey in these two countries. We did survey for in the Philippines, in the four or six um, provinces of the Philippines, which are mostly important for uh, 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 the uh, small scale fishers and also nine provinces in, in, in Thailand. So the, the objective, if you, if you see, uh, this was done during the 2020 and 2021 with four partners like government of uh, Royal Government of Thailand and BASC. In the Philippines, we have the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Agricultural Credit Policy Council. So these are the four organizations or four partners of ours. We, we worked with them. And uh, uh, keep, uh, I mean, it is basically kind of a you know, key initiative and were funded by FAO. Um, and uh, the objective, as I said, that to learn about the small scale fishing communities, identify the assistance and support the need for their sustainable fishing activities, particularly in accessing finance and insurance services, and gather information on the current capacities of the financial service providers to help these small scale fishers in accessing finance and insurance service for their sustainable fishing activity. So these are the two, two you can say, major uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, objective we had. And uh, as I already said, the survey was conducted and uh, we, we sir, conducted the survey both side, the demand and, uh, and, uh, and the supply side. And uh, the demand side, if, we, if you see the demand side, as, we, as I, the majority, like the 77%, use the loan to purchase a fishing vessels or fishing gears. It means that they are actually trying to build their asset. So only 13% credit, they took credit for buying or fee, uh, selling the fish. It means that most of them are actually you know, involved in the fishing activity, not the fishing, uh, selling the fish or I know uh, 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 their uh, uh, byproducts. So, and we what we also found in the demand side that there is a lack of awareness among the SSF or the institutions regarding the institutions offering financial services, which is very significant. And thirty eight percent of the respondent uh, reported that they may have contributed to the low incidence of borrowing of SSF. So. Borrowing is also, also and, and when we did, do, did a deep diving, it was observed a specific reason for availing the credit, non availing the credit and declare the non borrowing respondent. One is the insufficient income to prove their credit worthiness. This is one of the major issues where no feasible business and finally fear of getting indebted. So these are the three major reasons they said on the supply side, on the other hand, Supply side, the volatility of the borrower's business, lack of insurance cover, or you can say the guarantee. And the third one is a lack of technical knowledge. So these are the actually the uh, you know, our observation. And based on that, 
what we did, we designed a framework for supporting the financial services to the small scale fishers with a 3D approach. First D is the designing the product. In the designing the product, we have three parts of it. Feature of the product need to suit to all the actors in the fisheries ecosystem. No, we, we, don't, we want to leave that, that one uh, no size fit all. So, and consider the uh, environment, social uh, you know, governance as one of the major factors for um, developing the, uh, designing the credit product. Then affordability by the small scale fishers because they are our major uh, no, b b target. Then the activity should not harm the nature. The activity taken up by the farmer, fish farmer should not harm the nature and bring sustainability as the major outcome, as the major outcome of the whole uh, no, uh, lending process. The second one, second D is the delivery. So we, 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 we provide importance to the delivery is a last mile reach out, which is both online and offline. This is also very important because some of the microfinance institutions, they don't have much of this online uh, system, so they have to reach out offline. So that can be done through agents, correspondence, and digital finance mode. The second part of the delivery is the accessibility of the financial product across small scale features ecosystem. It is, it should be accessible to all. And the third one on this delivery is the follow-up services and inclusiveness. In most of the banking services or the financial services, what we found that after the, the finance, they don't follow up about what happened. And that is the not inclusiveness. So we want an inclusive uh, product here. And the third D is the delinquencies. Because majority of the bank, as I already said, that uh, in, uh, in, in our survey, uh, in the supply side, we found that the, the delinquency of non-payment of the delinquency, basically the non-payment of the loans are a major factor. So how, how to, how to uh, know, address this? So what we did, we, we designed three part of it, recognize the flow of finance and flow of commodities. Sometimes, most of the financial institutions, they don't want to recognize the internal financial system within the value chain of, of the fisheries. So we have to recognize that some uh, you know, major actors are financing to the small scale fishers has to be recognized. So if we recognize that, we will understand that how the finance are coming, what are the flow of finance and what are the flow of the commodity. The second, use blended structure. The blended structure here, uh, as uh, as per the uh, no uh, here, our blended structure is a little bit different because we we want credit insurance guarantee and technical assistance coming together from the same financial institution or maybe from the various financial institutions. Third one, in delinquency, the linking the small scale fishers with the major market players. So these, if we if we add these three in as a in our de uh, designing the product, then we are sure that this there will be no uh, delinquencies in the system. So based on these, we have already designed product in uh, for uh, in Thailand as well as in the Philippines, which are already in in piloting stage, and we will be coming out with our reports in the uh, in future. And there are some policy issues also we, we considered while, while developing uh, or designing this product. Uh, as you know, policy areas are very important development of suitable products and services. This is basically you no know, uh, uh, talk, but what we did, walk the talk. Then helping the financial service providers. This is very important. Everybody wants to help the SSFs, the small scale feasers, but nobody wants to help the uh, financial uh, service providers. So that that area, the policymakers need to be you know uh, need to give more importance and partnership. This is also very important partnership mm -hmm. with the fishers organizations or cooperatives. I think IDS already touched this support. Yes, these are, these are the areas. I I think uh, uh, this is the perspective we have. And if you have any other questions, I'm 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 here to answer. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Parason, for sharing all of this information. I think it's fascinating to hear the ins from, from the inside, you know, how these new instruments or new financial products, as, as you call them, are being designed. And the fact that you were actually drawing from the server surveys with the farmers, these points that you mentioned, the, the, the fears that they may have or the risks that they may have, which have to do with lack of technical knowledge, the volatility of the market, lack of insurance, this fear of debt, or even insufficient uh, income to act, act as collateral. So it's very interesting that you are basing your design from, from scratch, from the needs of the farmers, and you're keeping into consideration this, how can we avoid delinquency, as you mentioned, how can we help them pay back what they have to pay back, because that will benefit us all, and how can we help them actually have a positive impact on the environment and on their own livelihoods. Uh, I, I really like this explanation that you gave of this like 3D approach and the, and the design of the framework based on the survey. That is great. So thank you for, for, for all of that, Prasun. And we will get back to you just after we, we finish the first round with all of the panelists. Um, so I think it's good now if we move forward with, uh, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to talk to Erin from Grow Asia, and she's Grow Asia is a multi-stakeholder partnership platform that uh, catalyzes action for inclusive agricultural development in Southeast Asia. But Erin will be able to tell us a bit more about it. Uh, so welcome, Erin, and it's a pleasure to have for uh, having you here in this dialogue. Uh, so we've heard from the previous panelists uh, as well. Now I would like to hear from you uh, in terms of a bit of on sustainability standards and voluntary standards. How can uh, uh, agribusiness provide direct financial incentives to farmers through voluntary sustainability standards? And what barriers have you seen uh, to farmers in adopting this type of, of standards, which may decrease their incentive uh, for them to participate? So Erin, um, the, the floor is yours if you, if you wanna give us an answer to this question and, and talk a bit from the examples that you can share. Thank you so much, Josefina, and to IUCN Circa for hosting this event today. It's very exciting to be here with all of the other fantastic panelists, and we're grateful for the invitation for Croatia to participate. Just quickly to set the stage um, and give a bit of a sense of where Croatia is coming from in this conversation, we are, as Josefina mentioned, a multi-stakeholder platform. And over the last six years, we have focused primarily on improving livelihoods for smallholder farmers, which has resulted in us reaching 2 million smallholders through interventions that bring together the private sector, the public sector, and producer organizations. And Groasia as a network has six country offices that represent about 580 partners, 50% of which are agribusinesses, both SMEs and MNCs. So I'm speaking today, of course, not on behalf of agribusiness or the private sector, but really based on the insights that we have gained as an organization in working with these partners across the region. So I'd like to kick off just by sharing that, of course, voluntary sustainability standards are designed to benefit all the stakeholders that Croatia works with across the supply chain from farmers to off takers to customers. And ideally, voluntary sustainability standards would incentivize farmers to use these kinds of climate resilient practices. But we do see across ASEAN in all of our work some significant challenges to farmers in adopting these voluntary sustainability standard requirements and practices that would allow them to enter into those sustainable supply chains. So in the next few minutes, I'll cover just a few of those challenges, but I'll also give two examples, quick examples, from our agribusiness partners who are directly incentivizing smallholder farmers to take up uh, two of these voluntary sustainability standards. And then I'll close by sharing the work that Croatia is doing on a set of regional guidelines on promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry, which takes a bit of a step back from industry specific schemes um, and applies this um, understanding of responsible investment to the policy ecosystem. So a quick uh, overview of some of the challenges that we're seeing related to voluntary sustainability standards for farmers. Um, we do note, of course, that as Jimena already pointed out, um, that often voluntary sustainability standards cover the individual, don't cover the individual farms, but rather cover uh, that end product, which means that farmers um, will have to invest often their own capital in order to access training, 
on how to implement these required practices to comply with the scheme, which is cost not only to take the training, but also time away from the farm. Farmers may have to upgrade their equipment um, and invest in higher quality inputs as well, which again, they may see those returns after actually selling the product because they sometimes reach a premium price, um, but that upfront cost can be a real challenge as Irish uh, would likely be very familiar with as well. We also know that gender inequity can cause further barriers for farmers to access or participate in voluntary sustainability standard schemes because women farmers in ASEAN are less likely than men to access loans since they are less likely to hold land under their own names, which would be used as collateral. And in some countries in ASEAN, women even have a harder time accessing technical assistance due to cultural um, and or social and political uh, contexts and, and norms. So as I promised, I'm going to share a couple quick examples about agribusinesses who are working with farmers and their supply chains to adopt these uh, voluntary sustainability standards. The first example I want to give is in the rice value chain in Vietnam, where an agribusiness partner supports farmers to become certified under the Sustainable Rice Platform or SRP. I encourage everyone listening today, if you don't know SRP, to do a quick Google. I won't go into the details now, um, but SRP does provide a set of instruments and 12 principles specifically to help farmers participate in this scheme. And one of those principles is to reduce emissions during rice production. So this agribusiness partner uses contract farming with agri cooperatives to source their rice. And this partner has worked closely with a multilateral development bank to train thousands of farmers in SRP compliant practices, including cost saving uh, reductions in water and fertilizer use. And some recent research showed that when farmers are certified under SRP in this pilot, the price premium combined with the cost reduction achieved about an 18% increase in profit per hectare for those smallholder farmers participating in the pilot. We have another partner, uh, again in Rice in Cambodia, who works with 100,000 farmers also through agri cooperatives and contract farming, and again supports those farmers to become certified under SRP, but also under organic standards. And again, the agribusiness uses contract farming that assures that those farmers will already have a ready market. They'll receive higher prices for that product than if they were working with intermediary traders. And then also that premium price guarantee from when the rice is sold in the international market. So both of these examples are really interesting ways that agribusinesses are working to leverage voluntary sustainability standards to benefit smallholder farmers. And a couple key success factors that we've seen in these examples and others um, is where agribusinesses have access to technical assistance from other partners, whether they're NGOs or government extension, um, a strong enabling environment at the national or local level, access to additional investment uh, from DFIs or multi, uh, multi-development banks, or um, as Dr. Prasoon just mentioned, having access to partners even with other agribusinesses who have relationships with larger numbers of farmers where that agribusiness can then come in and participate. So we know though that challenges will continue to happen in this space um, because our agribusiness partners are telling us that there's still not enough finance for them to leverage to actually use to incentivize farmers to take up VSS but also that there can be a disconnect between the needs of farmers in applying these standards and the policies, the national policies that are aimed at providing technical assistance or even loans to farmers. And that disconnect can mean that the funds don't trickle down or they don't train the right farmers, um, as I mentioned with the gender inequity challenge, but that we still do see a continued focus among some agribusinesses in the region on CSR or kind of community development funds, which is not the same thing as those direct payments that can be possible through VSS. So Roasia is looking forward to continuing to partner um, with many organizations across the region to push not only opportunities related to voluntary sustainability standards, but also related to the ASEAN guidelines on promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture, and forestry, which is a significant part of our work now. 
Those guidelines are set up for policymakers, but they apply to any food, agriculture, or forestry value chain in the region and include a significant focus on how both agribusiness and financial investors should be applying their investment practices to benefit smallholder farmers, including ways that they can facilitate direct payments or incentives to those farmers throughout the investment process. So I'll put a link in the chat for those who might be interested in learning more about our work on the ASEAN guidelines. I'd be happy to dive into greater detail on any of the examples that I shared already. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Josefina. Thank you very much, Erin. That is a lot of very, very interesting information you just shared. So I just want to highlight a couple of points and, and then do a little follow-up question because uh, you mentioned some of the of the barriers to farmers in adopting some of the um, voluntary standards and also some of the challenges. You mentioned uh, sometimes it's, it's because they have to invest in training, they need to upgrade equipment and increase the, the quality output, which can be costly. And sometimes there's not enough policies that complement uh, this uh, and, and support the farmers um, uh, and give, giving them uh, assistance. But you also mentioned that then uh, with the price premium uh, that comes from the voluntary standards as, as well, and there, there's a really, really high increase in profit that benefits them and it actually compensate for, um, for all of the, the initial investment or, or the risk that they had to take at the beginning. But uh, when we were having this discussion before, uh, prior to the dialogue as, as well, you had mentioned that it's easier to work with a bigger scale or, or uh, farmers than with small scale farmers. And there are some special challenges that come, uh, that come with the small uh, scale farmers. So perhaps you can talk a couple of minutes or uh, just give an answer to this. What is the main difference and what can we do? What is the main challenge in implementing this type of standards or the Asian guidelines or uh, the, the, what it contains specifically to the small scale farmers and what we can do to overcome those challenges? Thanks, Josefina. We probably need an hour to answer the question about what we can do to overcome. <laughs> well, we have like two minutes hear, now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'll just very quickly say that, um, yes, I, I did share that um, when I saw actually the title of today's discussion, I was really excited to contribute. But as you know, I said, we do actually see a lack of solutions. And even I had to kind of crowdsource for quite a while to find some examples across our network where we do see um, agribusinesses and other partners helping farmers to receive those direct incentives from voluntary sustainability standards. Um, and yes, we do see that it's more challenging for smaller scale farmers because they have even less capital to invest in any of those upfront costs, if any. Um, and therefore, they're also incredibly risk averse. So I think we have a tendency in the um, kind of broader conversation about climate resilience to expect that smallholder farmers will be very ready to take up climate smart practices. And of course, yes, if it's going to benefit um, their yield and their crop output, of course, those farmers would be inclined to do it. But if they can't see a direct financial return almost immediately, it will be very difficult for those smaller scale farmers to be able to participate in these kinds of value chains. Mm. That said, there are some projects in the region. Um, one in particular is called Trade for Sustainable Development, where the International Trade Center trains consultants to go out and train companies who work with small scale farmers on how to help farmers more easily participate in that voluntary sustainability standard and reduce those upfront costs. Um, but again, this is a, a one example of, of many, but we do still see, I think, a lack of those opportunities to directly incentivize with capital, smaller scale mm -hmm. farmers who are most in need of that capital to begin with. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for that answer. And I think this is a good opportunity to bring in the next panelist, uh, who is also a partner with Grow Asia. He's from Financial Access, Mr. Elko Bronghorst. He will be drawing. Um, uh, Mr. Elko, welcome to this dialogue, first of all, and thank you for joining us. And I would love to ask you a question, perhaps drawing from the examples that have been implemented in the region, if you could share with us uh, how Financial Access has built business cases that are investable across landscapes and commodities, and how do you connect them with farmers? So if you can expand a bit about the, this, this, the type of the, the, the design part, but also the implementation uh, of this of this process as well. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone uh, at the call. It's great to be here. Um, maybe to start before I, I, I go to your question, um, 
you know, we, we come from the financial sector. So we, um, you know, financial access, uh, you know, is originated from, from the banking sector and, and we were taken private um, many years ago to focus specifically on addressing the, uh, the supply and demand in, in, in agri-finance, which we see not in Asia alone, but, but in many other countries. So, you know, with these financial sector glasses on, we look at the various challenges I think, that we're talking about uh, today. Um, and what we've seen, and, and, and that's really what, what started, I think, uh, our, our approach, we're seeing a very big dis disconnect between, on the one hand, the requirements for investment in sustainable agriculture. And at the same time, we're seeing a massive amount of capital that is available to be invested uh, in, in, in agriculture, you know, globally across many, many different landscapes and, and commodity chains. So we were wondering why is it that, that impact investors and banks and, and a lot of different other financial sector players, you know, are committed or are being, uh, being pushed toward more sustainable finance, yet at the same time, there, there is relatively little finance that would flow to these investment opportunities. I think that's the starting point for our work and, and, and the focus that, uh, that we have mm -hmm. in, in addressing this, uh, this issue. Um, I think there's a very important element that I'd like to uh, address when you talk about the development of business cases and investment cases, because sometimes we get confused in those. I mean, a business case um, is, is relatively easy to, to develop if you identify you know, what the, um, the, the investments are within a certain supply chain, what are the technical system needs you know, to get these, uh, these farmers up to a certain level so that they become investable. Uh, and, and, and relatively, I wouldn't call it simple, but relatively straightforward to, uh, to put those together. But to actually um, make a business case investable, you also need to very much look at what the financial sector requires. And that's really where the challenge comes in. And because the financial sector uh, consists of many different players with all different requirements, and very often with, um, with, with in essence, a different background uh, than, than the many agricultural experts and researchers and, and government officials and, and, and anyone that is so committed to, to improving sustainability in these fragile agricultural landscapes. Um, so by really understanding, you know, what does that, that capital come from and, and you know, what, what is it that they would require, you're looking at a, a myriad of different challenges. You're looking at um, not only economic uh, return requirements, you're looking at regulatory issues, looking at very particular uh, impact requirements. Um, uh, you're looking at, uh, at, at, well, very often also cultural differences when it comes to, um, to understanding what, what they would require and what's actually uh, available in terms of opportunities. <clears throat> Um, so that's really where, where, where we, we start our, um, our work typically in developing these, these investment cases. Now, if, if, you, if you basically break down that, that pool of capital that's available to invest in sustainable agriculture, um, we, we look at, at this from, from top to bottom. You have the very large um, you know, multilateral uh, financial institutions like the World Bank and IFC and the Asia, uh, Asia Development Bank. You have the bilateral uh, development finance institutions like Proparco, like FMO, like DEG um, and, and, and the likes. Um, but, but these are relatively small players when you look at the overall investments that are required within these landscapes. And in our view, the, the key to to address the financial challenges in these, these landscapes lies within the local financial sector. If you would really look at um, the, the pool of liquidity uh, that you see in, in, in countries like Indonesia, um, Vietnam, but in smaller countries uh, like Cambodia as well, you'll see that there's a misallocation of that liquidity towards where, where this, this funding is, is required. Um, and the question is, how, how is that? And why, why is that? And then you're getting into all kinds of issues like 
well, banks are not incentivized very often, you know, through regulation. Um, bankers uh, very often are not trained or skilled and don't have the technology and tools to assess the very particular risk for agriculture. There's a, a whole opportunity there to, uh, to, to, to work with, you know, with that sector to, to get them closer. Now, if you look at um, um, what, what does that really mean in practice, um, I always give the example in, uh, in, in, in presentations that I give to, to, you know, to various stakeholders in this space, um, and especially to, uh, to conservationists and researchers. They said, well, if you're a financial institution, if you're a, an impact investor, um, does anyone know what, what a term sheet is? Because that's the document that, that very often gets, gets investors moving. And that term sheet determines very often, you know, not only what, what the risks is that need to be addressed, but also, you know, what the return requirements are, um, and what, what the collateral and risk mitigants are. Um, and it's, it's staggering to see very often that, that a lot of the organizations that are working so closely with these farmers and are so committed to change simply don't, don't have that knowledge to be able to you know, to, to, to work uh, with the financial sector because of that, you know, that, that gap, um, you know, between, call it the translation, lost in translation, translation type of um, uh, dynamic. Um, if you look at what, what, we, what we have done um, it to, to, to bridge that, I would like to give one particular example that we're currently uh, deploying in, in a replanting rubber scheme in, in Indonesia, um, um, where, where we've identified the replanting needs uh, in, a, in a large agroforestry scheme and, and realized that, that, that this is, was not something that we could chase, take just to the bank. Very often these investment cases are, are not very well developed, they need to be structured, there's a lot of hand-holding and technical assistance required to get them to a level of instability. And one of the key items that we've seen here, and I see we see that really across a number of commodities that would look for long-term investment, for example, for re rejuvenation or for replanting, we've really seen that, that the impact investors that we, we started to work with in this scheme basically said, you know, we cannot do investments less than 5 million. When the average investment need for the farmer was, was just $1,200. And if you would just aggregate the number of farmers that would need that financing within a certain time frame, um, we came up with uh, a number of, of just over $2 million for the first batch. And, and because those investment requirements are embedded into the, uh, into the investment rules of these funds, um, this became a non-starter from the beginning. So we went back to the drawing table and said, how is it and why is it that if the total investment need over the next 15 years in that landscape is actually 75 million and the initial investment required is so less, why don't we then try to work around the scheme where the minimum investment level of that fund could be brought down to maybe 1 million, but we would extend the length of that fund to 25 million. Because in essence, the, the, the risk that this fund would run at any time, you know, would, would, be, would be less than 3 million. And it's just an example. And, and, and this fund mm -hmm. actually went back to the drawing table. They started to, to, um, to look at this again. And, and, and is now willing to, um, to look at this in an entirely different way um, so that it, it's able to address those very specific circumstances and requirements that these farmers within these landscapes require. I know we're, we're short of time, but Thank happy you, to Elka. talk about that in a bit more detail if needed. Thank you very much. And I think it's great to have also this, this perspective that you're bringing from the impact investors and from, from the private sector and the disconnect that you mentioned between this massive amount of capital and the requirements for in investment in sustainable agriculture. And uh, actually, you also mentioned this massive amount of capital that is available, right, uh, for, for agriculture. So I wanted to ask you if you see a difference in this available capital 
for the global south versus for the global north and what may be the drivers of these differences because that is uh, exactly what one of our studies from COSI, one of the, the evidence that we are producing has uncovered so we would love to to hear a bit more from this so basically if you see a difference in the capital available in the north and in the south and how can we assure ensure that this capital flows to the globe that the capital that flows to the global south can benefit nature and people that that is the main challenge so perhaps in Quick answer, one, two minutes. I know it, we could talk about uh, this for two hours, but uh, yes, back to you. Yeah, so um, there is a lot of capital available in the global north to be allocated to the global south, but that capital comes primarily from the large development finance institutions and through grant programs, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the overall requirements and the availability of capital that's available from the global north to the global south, it's a drop in the bucket, frankly. I think we've looked at research, maybe two to 3% of the total investment requirements, you know, could be covered, you know, from that leverageable type of um, capital that very often we, you know, in, in involves, you know, subsidy schemes and grant funding and very often, you know, is, is, is blending finance. The answer to, 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 the, to the challenge, therefore, is, is, is not that that initial capital that would be able to take the early risk and to develop pilot models to be replicated at scale, it is actually working with the local financial sector, working with local institutional investors and pension schemes and, 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 and insurance models and uh, you know, different types of uh, institutions in these countries where you see um, a, a, a really a huge amount of capital you know, sitting on bank accounts. If you look at uh, the loan deposit rates, I'm not sure how familiar you are with those, but look at the loan deposit rates of the largest banks in your countries, and you'll see that actually um, a large part of, the, of the, the, the loans that banks are providing um, is, is much less than, than you know, the savings and the deposits that these banks have attracted and mm -hmm. are basically recirculating back to the government to invest in treasury bonds and others. Well, that's the, the type of capital, that's the surplus, right? The saving surplus that you want to be allocated to these, these, these types of programs for which capital is so, so, uh, so much needed. Thank you, Elkon. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating in this dialogue. I will now turn again to all of our panelists just for a quick round of last thoughts. Um, we have a couple, we have some minutes left, but I would love to hear from everyone maybe in one minute or less, what is the main lesson or the, the, the take home message that you personally, from, from your perspective and from your, uh, yes, from, from your perspective of the actor that you're representing as well, can share with the rest um, of the audience listening today. So um, perhaps we can begin, I'll get back to Gamini, Dr. Samara Singh, if you would like to share your last thoughts in one minute or less, the take home messages for, for you from this dialogue. Yeah, thank you once again, uh, Jaspina. Uh, so what I see, see is uh, in uh, Sri Lankan context, the main issue is the, uh, the the marketing system because we we see a lot of agriculture producers are we find these leans and plugs, right? So ma we have to in any project or any government project, we have to take care of the whole marketing chain value, right? All marketing chain is taken care of. That would be ideal to have a successful project. And the uh, other thing is, we are lacking a lot of information regarding mm -hmm. the uh, grassroots level information. Although we have these grass, grassroots level officers, the getting correct information has been a problem. So we are developing a information management system, which which covers all the uh, even the lands, uh, land belongings, the production subsidies fertilizer and also the value chain so mm -hmm. once we develop it i think that will be a very useful uh, uh, information system that can be uh, coupled with all the agricultural interventions and uh, have a very uh, good system we we hope thank you very much super thank you so information data availability and capacity building would be the, one of the main things to highlight from from your perspective let's move on then to irish again irish from the asian farmers association what are your couple of key messages or lessons from this dialogue 
Yes, uh, thank you, Josefina. So uh, I think I have um, uh, a few points and it's wonderful listening to uh, the various, uh, uh, various speakers. And I think uh, one of the common uh, things that, that I have seen is really working with um, organizations, agri-cooperatives, um, Again, uh, if we go back to the, the issue of um, small scale, which is we know in, in uh, Asia, that's the characteristics of um, one of the characteristics of uh, the family farmers um, working with their organization or um, really uh, helping uh, so that they can, be, uh, they can be more stronger organization um, is really uh, promising um, given the, the context of uh, what we are uh, talking about now and um what we have seen what one of the uh, initiative that i have not mentioned because of the time limitation is an initiative in bangladesh with fao it's um increasing um access to finance of farmers organization and i think i want to bring in the key lesson there which is really partnership and it can be done in a large scale if because of the partnerships that were um involved or the partners that were involved so fao handholding with the farmers organization and working directly with apex um, organization um, in bangladesh and working you know negotiating with the banks as mentioned by one of the speaker we, they did a lot of um, advocacy and uh, you know um, negotiation with with the banks to invest mm -hmm. or to to really uh, reach out to the farmers organization and cooperatives in in bangladesh so uh, that's okay. the the second uh, point so partnership handholding um and really uh, the the last i think the last point i wanted to leave is uh changing the narrative of uh, you mm -hmm. know looking at farmers not as problems but as part of the solution, the solution. again uh, mm -hmm. farmers for people for the planet um, yeah for nature Thank you very much, Irish. That there are some great take home messages that you've just given us. And I think it also relate, relates directly to what Kasun was saying earlier about like bringing the farmers in from the design process, consider their needs. So Prasun, what are your key messages from this dialogue apart from that one? Yeah, thanks, uh, Josefina, uh, for the second opportunity. Actually, no, there are uh, not a couple. I, I'll, I'll go for three, but very short. One is uh, while designing the financial product for uh, you know, uh, by the financial service providers, for example, the banking system or the microfinance, they need to build the adaptive capacity. That's very important. So the, uh, uh, the ultimate aim of the financial product is not to sell the product, but to build the adaptive capacity to scaling up of the financial services. So that is the most important message I want to uh, draw here. The so second one is that we generally believe because our banking system, they have a common product, which they want to do it for all, which is which doesn't fit in the whole system because the commodity chains are different. Their requirements are different. So we need to design the product based on their requirement, as I said previously also. So mm -hmm. we have to leave aside the, uh, uh, one size fit all. The third one, which is also important, is rather very important, is recognizing the importance of other actors in the value chain who actually mm -hmm. are the drivers. So we do not generally recognize as a banker or the financial institution, we are skewed towards only the financial, uh, only the first small scale farmer. So we need to understand that also. So I think I have this three. Thank you. Audrey. Thank you. Thank you, Prasun, for those insights. Wonderful. Let me turn again now to Erin, last, last minute uh, thoughts. Thank you. And a lot of great points have just been made. So I'll just mm -hmm. add yeah. on a few. Um, but I think the, the take home message I'd like to leave everyone with is the need to kind of let go of some of our preconceived notions about what will and won't work when we're looking at uh, working with farmers, whether smallholders all the way through larger farms. And I have kind of three key points under that need to break down these notions so that 
agribusinesses can work, can and do work together. So we're increasingly seeing partnerships between agribusinesses and different supply chains, but, but who are collaborating to provide training um, as a joint united front to reduce their costs so that more premium can go back to the farmers. We also want to see greater collaboration across value chains by using something like the landscape approach, which mm -hmm. our partner IDH is piloting in several countries in ASEAN. Um, and that lastly, to be able to promote what's already working, like some of the examples that have been given today, um, into broader forums through things like case studies, which GrowAsia is about to start publishing, in order to actually take these pilots from a pilot level to a scaled up, much mm -hmm. larger level, because they're receiving that kind of um, awareness from players like financial institutions who might like to, to invest. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Erin. Last but not least, uh, the last thoughts from Elko. Anything to add to what your, your fellow panelists have already said? Um, well, just, just a few points. I think some, some very uh, important issues were raised. And um, I think we, uh, as I mentioned, we, we come from the financial sector, right? So we, 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 we see a lot of um, movement into this and we also, understand that, uh, that, that ultimately the financial sector would have to play an absolute critical role you know, to, to, to make uh, you know, these changes that are required. But um, what, I've, what I've heard today is some very interesting examples you know, across the globe, not only in Asia, but also in the, in the video that we've seen before, the work that's done in, in, um, in South America. And, and I believe it would be useful to see how we could combine all these, diff combine all these different you know, models and, and, um, and, and pilot cases uh, into um, an initiative where we could see how we could help to scale and to replicate these so that they become bankable investment opportunities for a range of different investors, as I just, uh, just mentioned. Because I do Thank think you. that there's still a very big disconnect between what's out there in terms of opportunities and needs and, and what, what the financial sector requires, I think. And by involving these, these actors early on in, in, in a co-creation mm -hmm. process and, and establishing partnerships that would you know, bring this financial sector in in a committed manner, I think is a, is a huge opportunity that, that possibly has not been, been fully utilized. Thank you very much, Elko. And this is something that we're also trying to do with these dialogues is uncover good examples and good practices that are happening across different regions and being able to share them with the rest of the world so we can learn from those experiences, from the good and from the bad as well. So thank you very much to all of our panelists. That is the end of our time for the panel today. And before closing, I would just like to thank again our co-organizers, IUCN and Siarka once again. And I will leave the floor to the director of Siarka, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, to give us some uh, closing remarks for this dialogue. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. Gregorio, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Asipina. And it was uh, really indeed a very insightful and productive afternoon. I, I enjoyed listening to the presentations. I saw the challenges. I saw the difficulty of the finance, financing part. And of course, the discussion that tackles something that I'm sure is very interesting to many of us, the financial aspect of this, the innovative financial mechanism. The need for effective and uh, innovative financial mechanism has always been a challenge, not only in agriculture, but how much more in agriculture uh, uh, nowadays. This has uh, further highlights the highlighted with the pandemic, as we have witnessed in the struggles of our food producers, the farmers and farming families. Today, we have seen the significant finding, findings of how financial incentives had been used in farming, as well as the major gaps and the needs for innovation. We have to innovate, we have to uh, convince the financial uh, part sector to invest on, on agriculture, sustainable agriculture. And we have, heard, uh, we have heard some tips from the industry, from the financial uh, team itself that we have to be focusing on this, not only on our advocacy, but on profit and also because that's what they, they want. At the same time, we, we hide uh, whatever advocacy we have to make this 
uh, really happen. It is also uh, important to bring together the key players from the academe, from the industry, and government to provide a mutual beneficial support and the necessary tools to promote equity, to promote equity and sustainability in agriculture. Uh, this is well aligned with our CIRCAS 11 five-year plan with an overarching theme on accelerating transformation through agricultural innovation or attain, which the financial aspect is very important. Thus, in this uh, regional dialogue is timely and relevant. We have learned to appreciate more the regulatory principles, the regulatory approaches, enabling environment, voluntary standards, designs, and most importantly, implementation of innovation, uh, innovative financial system uh, mechanisms. Let me take this opportunity to extend our utmost gratitude to our partners, especially to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, led by my friend, Dr. Dindo Campilan and the officials and representative of the Commission of Sustainable Agriculture Intensification and the uh, SDG Center for Latin America and Caribbean. Thank you for your commitment to promote agricultural sustainability as well as the critical, uh, the critical importance of innovation. We have to be very innovative here. Uh, we, we would also like to thank our speakers, our panelists for sharing their time, their expertise, their tips, how to strategize, how to really be, uh, get the heart of the financial institutions to fund agriculture and the sustainability of agriculture. And to all our participants, may this not just be another virtual event for you. We hope that this learning from this dialogue lead us to better, bigger, and smarter impacts from the outcomes of the regions and beyond. Again, thank you, and God bless us all. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Glenn, once again, and thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your days and your weeks. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Josefina. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um...